Just worship tonight. When I gaze into your loveliness, when all things that surround me come shadow in the light of you, when I found the joy of reaching your heart, when my will becomes enthralled in your love, when all things that surround become shadow in the light of you, I worship you, I worship you, the reason I live is to worship you. I worship you, I worship you, the reason I live is to worship you. Just worship him, Lord Jesus, we just thank you, Lord, for being here tonight, Lord. We thank you for your presence being here. We thank you for your word, just promising, declaring that you'll be here, two or three together to be here, Lord. Lord, we just want to invite you into our hearts tonight as we hear your uh, servant preach the word, Lord. I pray you use him in such a mighty way, Lord. Speak to our hearts tonight, Lord. We just want to invite you, Lord. Just be Lord of our life, Lord. We just praise your holy, precious name. You're worthy, Lord. Just be glorified, Lord Jesus. We want to lift you up, Lord. You're worthy to be lifted up. Just praise your holy, precious name. You're worthy, O Lamb of God. Just praise you, Jesus. We change the order. I'd like to invite our precious brother Josiah up and we'll sing Only Believe. Let's take God at his word tonight. Let's only believe. Only believe. Only believe. All things are possible. Only believe now, Lord. I believe, Lord. I believe all things are possible, Lord. I believe. I believe. Lord, I believe. How many believe tonight? Amen. Question is, what do you believe in? Right. You believe something, but what is it that you believe in tonight? Amen. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Amen. Do you believe that you're His blood-bought possession tonight? Amen. Do you believe that you've been filled with His Holy Spirit? Amen. Made Amen. a partaker of His divine nature tonight? Amen. Well, let me ask you this. Do you believe that you're right where God wants you to be tonight? Amen. The Bible says that wherever two or three are gathered, He would be with us in our midst. And it also says that do not forsake the assembling of yourself so much the more as the end approaches. How many believes we're at the end? How many believes we're approaching it? Well, I, I want to be right where God wants me at the end. And in, a, in fellowship with the saints, I, I believe that's a good place for us to be tonight. Amen. Let's go ahead and Go in prayer to our Lord. Dear Lord Jesus, we just come before you, Father. Lord, just so appreciative to be able to come in the congregation of the saints yet again. It's your grace that we can fellowship together, Lord. Lord, your mercy that you purged us of your sin. Lord, that you spared us from judgment, but your grace, your divine favor, that not only would you spare us from sin, not only would you put us in fellowship with yourself, but that you would put us in fellowship with such wonderful company, a family of God. Lord, maybe, maybe some here tonight wouldn't know what family was like before they came to the family of God. But Lord, you instruct us in right relationships. Amen. And thank you so much that we could come here and relate one to another through your word, Lord, and through your blood. 
as we now turn ourselves to your word, Lord, we desire to relate to your word, Father. I pray that you'd open it up to each one, Lord, and show us positionally where we are in these last days. Grant it, dear Lord Jesus. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Well, I won't keep you standing, saints. We'll go straight to the word tonight. I'm so glad to hear that your pastor's coming home. We'll be turning over to Joel chapter 2 and also Song of Solomon chapter 2. But uh, just so happy to hear that Brother John's on his way home to you. I know being without him for a while, that can be a little bit of a, uh, a troubling time for sheep. I, I know I don't like being without my pastor for long back home. I believe the prophet said that after a while, you know, the sheep, they get a little bit, they get a little bit nervous without the shepherd. And uh, I think that's just the case. But I don't think there's any reason for us to be n- nervous one to another tonight. We're all home folk here. We know one another. I see a couple of a uh, couple of faces that maybe we don't know each other as well, but we're all in the family of God together. Amen. So we're looking forward to our fellowship tonight. Joel chapter 2, verse 223. The prophet Joel here cries forth a familiar scripture. He says, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, And he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floor floor shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you that which the canker worm and the locust hath eaten, and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. Songs chapter 2, just to return to our uh, verses that we read on Sunday together. Um, chapter 2 and verse 10. Solomon and the bride exchange their greetings one to another, and the bride says of her beloved, says, who we know is a type of Christ, who says, My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, and the rain is over and gone. Now what happens after the rain is over and gone? It says, the flowers appear on the earth. The time of the singing of birds is come, and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs, and the vines with the tender grapes give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, come away. May the Lord add the blessings to his word as you're seated. Preaching Sunday with you folks here in Speaking of these tender grapes and how the bride and the bridegroom are looking forward to enjoy these tender grapes one with another. And I, I have to step back and, and recognize that when we're preaching along these lines, there may be some believers that might feel that they're not being partakers of these tender grapes. And when we start to look at the word and realize that maybe we're coming up short or there's still some more of the word that, that, we're, that we're needing to inherit, some more of the word that we're looking to possess, we we start to think about these re-words like restoration and redemption and revival because we, we realize that we want to come back to something, something that we're called to. And that, that prefix re means to be brought back to. Revive simply means to revitalize, to take someone that was once vital and simply make them vital again. Amen. It doesn't mean that you, you were always dead. And that God just comes along and and picks you up. It means that one time you were alive in Christ, but at some time you lost maybe the joy of the Lord. And it's time to revitalize yourself in Christ. Redemption simply means to be brought back to God. Now, many times we think of redemption as the first time we ever come to God. But it turns out that the Bible says that by predestination, God knew us already from the foundation of the world. And so we know that redemption means to simply God brought, bought us back by His blood to Himself. Amen. You were always His. You were always in Christ. From the foundation of the world, He knew you. And by His foreknowledge, He predestinated you, yes, the Apostle Paul says. So my, I, I think we can just about get a revival tonight just thinking about God's words. Amen. But so many times people, when they begin to think about a revival, they, they start looking for something to come that's outside of themselves. And they, they want God to, to have a special disp- dispensation of grace, perhaps, some, some kind of extra rain that they're looking to fall, have fall down on them. 
And so I, I wanted to come back and maybe look at this scripture tonight where the prophet Joel is promising a rain. He says there's going to be a former rain. Uh, they, they say a, a mora, which that means a, a teaching rain. And there's going to be a latter rain, which is the harvest rain. And that's going to come forth at the same time, he says. And so I wanted to just maybe take a little bit of a teaching tonight. And uh, we'll see if it goes off into preaching a little bit and, and a little bit of preaching, but we'll just see where the Lord leads tonight. Amen. But I wanted to come back and, and look at the words of our prophet to start with and how Brother Branham approached this scripture verse. Now, before we start there, I, I want to say that that rain in, in, the Philist, in, in, the, in, in that area of Israel there, um, that climate there, that mora, that teaching rain, is considered the, the, at the end of October and the beginning of November, it's considered the, the period of winter, the commentator says. It's from the end of October until the end of March, and that rain does not entirely cease. That early may, rain means the first autumnal showers which prepare the arid soil for seed. So the early rain is the rain preparing for some kind of seed. And the latter rain is the later spring showers, especially in March, which bring forward the crop towards harvest. And at that time, the crop is then brought forward to harvest, not in March when the rain is falling, but later on in May is when the wheat harvest is brought forth. So that's kind of the, the, uh, the climate that we're talking about that the, the prophet Joel is speaking from. And Brother Branham says in the spoken word is the original seed, he says, someone asked me to repeat that Hebrew word again in Joel, the second chapter. And the word former in, is the Hebrew word for mora, which means teaching. In other words, it'll be a teaching rain and then also a harvest rain. And he says, now we've had the teaching rain and we're ready now for the harvest rain. This is 1962. Now we've had the teaching rain. And you know the first rain is when you plant the seed that starts your crop of growing. And then just before it matures, there comes another crop. And that's what they call the harvest rain, the spring rains. About June, it makes your crop, and the rain we find out was the Spirit. So we have this early type that the rain in the Bible is a type of the Spirit. So now, in the same sermon, Brother Branham asks the congregation, why then has the revival fires let up? He says, you don't hear very much of Billy Graham like the great evangelist, Oral Roberts not burning forth a country like he used to. And my meetings is not even heard of. There's just three. And he says, what's the matter? And isn't that what we ask ourselves, even in our own lives, is what's the matter? Now, Billy Graham, the world was burning up here long ago with Billy Graham. Very seldom hear of it now. Billy Graham's now gone on in our age. So what's the matter? Who's next? What's next for the bride? What's next for God's people? That's what human naturally looks for. He says, Oral Roberts just burning up the earth, but dying down. Now Tommy Osborne, all of them good godly men, but what's happened? And believing that God called me for ministry, he says, what's happened to mine? And you say, well, Brother Branham, yours is the deadest of them all. He says, that's, that's true. That is right, 1962. He says that. Brother Branham, are you saying that you're telling us here that you actually believe the word and everything? Then what's happened to you then? What's taken place? That's what we want to know. Now, put her down in your mind and now pull down the umbrella and shake off the rain and open up your heart here just a minute. That's what we want to do tonight is let's open up our heart here just a moment. Because I think even today we have the same question is what's the matter? The coming of the Lord is supposed to be upon us. What's the matter? Is my life lining up? When I look at all the churches around me, are they lining up? What's going to take place to get us ready for the coming of the Lord? Right. What's the matter? He says, remember, the Bible said in Genesis first chapter that every seed comes after its kind. And it'll have to bring forth after its kind. So I believe that it's near the harvest time. And the seeds are being planted now. He says, oh, I wish you could just see what passed before me then. Oh, something is happening. I can see it passing before me. It's done, caught the Spirit. It's no longer just Brother Branham speaking as a man, but God is coming down in this sermon and quickening it. 
He says, Amen. Oh, now I know this is the truth. It's thus saith the Lord. By vision, see, move. Can't hardly look down here. Every time I look, see, it's just and something's happening, you see. So now we can have, we can have certainty that God's inspiring this. He says, I believe it's near the harvest time. The seeds have been planted. The denominational seeds of the churches, such as the evangelicals, like the Baptist, the Presbyterian, the Lutheran, and the Pentecostal seeds has been planted where? Into the Pentecostal organization by great men like Oral Roberts and Tommy Hicks and Osborne, great men of God. And I believe that the word of God has been planted unadulterated away from all those organizations. Now the seed must be planted, and then it must have water in order to grow. Amen. See, why did we have it in that planting time? It's the former rain. He says the teaching rain has went forth. And he says, now what's the matter now? Now she is waiting for the latter rain. You throw forth all your seeds in that teaching rain, but now you have to wait for the latter rain to come and quicken it. He says, that's when she produces her fruits. Then the kind of seed that you plant in your field will be the kind of crop you'll reap. If the denominations want more members, that's what they're going to get. The Pentecostals want more Pentecostals. The Baptists want more Baptists. Well, they're going to get that. But the Word is going to produce sons and daughters of God. Amen. What's a son and a daughter of God? It's that person who has been made a partaker of the divine nature, filled with God's Holy Spirit and identified with the Word of God. Not a creed, not a dogma, not something that he recitates because that's what his, his, his church says, but something that he himself has come into alignment with the Word. He's recognized it in the Word by his own self, and something has quickened him. Not because a man, William Branham, said it. Not because a man, Josiah Cornett or John Martin, said it. Not because his mammy or his pappy said it, right. but because there's something, there's a seed on the inside, a seed gene of God, a predestinated seed, a very part of God that God made in his own image. Yes. The same seed that was in Adam, that God made man in his own image. Amen. And that seed of God recognizes something in the word. Yes. And it lines itself up and identifies it and says, that's the truth. Amen. He says, he might, he might be looking at Acts 2.38 for the first time and going back and forth to Matthew where it says, teach all, teach all men to be baptized in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and the name of the Holy Ghost. And he hears the teaching from the prophet, sure, but the prophet says, well, look at Acts 2.38. Jesus Christ is the name of the Father, the name of the Son, the name of the Holy Ghost. Now, it's not just because a prophet's teaching it. The prophet is just, the Bible says that the word of the Lord comes to the prophet. But it's not the prophet that quickens sons and daughters of God. It's the word of the Lord coming through that vessel. God using that vessel. Behold, I'll send Elijah my prophet before the great and coming day of the Lord. To what turn? Not, it's not all about a prophet. There's something in that scripture that I identify with. My name's in Malachi 4, 5, and 6. It's not about Elijah the prophet. It's about those sons and those daughters Amen. that have their hearts turned back to the Pentecostal fathers. Amen. And I can say, now I recognize what the word is for my life. Amen. Now I recognize I have to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ Amen. so that I can receive my promises. Amen. The promise of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So Brother Bram says in 1962, they're waiting for that seed to come forth and the kind of seed or the, that rain to come forth. And whatever the seed was, that's what they're going to get. Now be careful here because when we, when we throw down our seeds, a lot of times what we throw down is based upon what we want to see come forth. Amen. Brother Branham often taught us to, to expect things from God. But the fact of the matter is that oftentimes we get what we expect, isn't it? And it's not just with the Word of God, but there's a principle here that our expectations yield forth fruit. Amen. Whether that fruit is unto godliness or that fruit's off the Word. If I expect that I'm going to have a, a bad day, even though God intended for me to have a bad day, a, a good day, I'm probably going to still have a bad day because right. that's right. what I was expecting. Right. 
And, and Brother Branham talks about this. He says, the very next day after the spoken word is the original seed, he says, they've been talking so much now about a latter rain. Now remember, he just said that we're waiting for that latter rain. But now he says, they're talking about it and not discarding you latter rain, brethren, but that's not latter rain. What were they doing? They were manufacturing some expectation. He says, if the latter rain would have been there, the power of God would have struck that thing and she would have swept the world. The latter rain is fixing to come, but what's the matter? The church is manufacturing herself something just like Eve tried to do. And isn't that just about human nature? When we start asking ourselves questions like, what's the matter? Well, especially the men in the room, we want to fix it right away. That's, the, that's, the, that's what happens with my wife. I ask her, what's the matter? And I'm, I'm asking it because I want to fix the problem. And, and God don't need us to fix his problems. Matter of fact, God don't have any problems. But he needs us to catch the movement of the Spirit. Amen. The Bible says that sons and daughters of God are led by the Spirit of God. He wants us to act like his sons and daughters. But the church, he says, is manufacturing herself something. She, just like Eve tried to do, she tried to have more light to manufacture something, and we've done and gone done the same thing, trying to make something in ourselves. See, keep your hand off of it. Let God do it. Take his word and believe it. Hold that in your heart, and the, when the rain begins to fall, it will take hold, and the word will manifest its own self. Amen. You kind of start to see what people's expectations are based on some of the questions that they, they ask Brother Branham. And questions and answers, you can pick it up there where someone says, Will the bride before Jesus comes, will she have all power of the Holy Ghost, perform miracles and raise the dead and so on as in the latter rain? Or is this the latter rain for the 144,000 Jews? Will all ministers have this? Or are we just waiting for the coming? Isn't, isn't that... That just shows what people are looking for, doesn't it? Will the, will, will the bride have all power of the Holy Ghost to perform miracles, raise the dead? Is this the latter rain? Well, now, wait a second. If I go back to Mark, it said that we already had that power. That they will, they will raise, lay hands on the sick. The right. sick will recover. They will cast out demons. They will bring the dead back to life again. Right. And it didn't say anything about wait for the latter rain. It right. said, this is the mark of sons and daughters of God. Amen. Those who believe in me will manifest this. Amen. Right. Now, you may not manifest all those things all the time, but those things will be resident within the body of Christ. Yeah. So look at how Brother Branham answers this. And it's so good because he doesn't come out and answer it directly because he doesn't, I, I believe it's, he addresses more the expectation behind the question. Because he doesn't ever say, well, yes, they will, or well, yes, they will not. That goes without saying. But he says, the question is, can you nurse? Seems like his answer doesn't have anything to do with the question. But he says, the real question here is, can you nurse? So this person's got some kind of expectation, probably somebody saying, I, I need something to happen here. And Brother Branham says, the question is, can you nurse? He says, that same question came to the Pentecostals, and they couldn't do it. They grabbed a breast from the old denomination they came out of, but then the real seed to come comes and nurses from that breast. See, that was the last sign that Abraham had before the promised son, that they'd waited all these years. God was standing in the form of a man and could discern the thoughts that was in Sarah's heart. It goes back to what happened just before Abraham inherited his promise of a son. Because the last sign that they had was here, God came and discerned the thoughts that was in Sarah's heart. Remember when she laughed up her sleeve behind the tent, when God said that Abraham would have a son. And he would visit him not many days hence. And that was the last sign that they had, and then the promise came. And after that, she came back to a young woman, a young man, Isaac, was brought forth on the scene, the promised son. And he says, now I believe you're seeing the last thing that will happen to the church before the rapture. I believe it. The rain is over. 
This is 1964. 1962, he said that we're waiting for that rain. Just two years later, he says, the rain's over. That's what's promised the church right there. You notice the other day when we started the trumpets, the Holy Spirit said that don't belong here. See, we're just now to wait on the coming of the Lord. Just wait. Keep your lamps trimmed, all filled with the Spirit. Pray up every hour, not every day. Just keep ready. Be sweet and watch it. The question is, what happened? 1962 to 1964, what happened? He said the rain was there. We're waiting for it. Now he says the rain's over. And watch what your expectation is. Just nurse from God. Brother Branham gives some insight into it earlier in that year of 1964, recognizing your day and its message. Oh, how important it is to recognize our day. Everywhere now, he says, there's no revival. Everybody is complaining. Ministers, outstanding papers that comes here to the church. A very fine paper. And I know the editor and I know the people, and they're a very fine brother, sister, more of the Herald of His Coming, one of the finest papers in the field. And it's all about fast, pray, sound the trumpet, fast, pray, something's about to happen. Let's make something break forth. We're going to have a great breaking day. There's going to be something happen. All of you, pray, pray, pray. We're not too late yet. You see that, that pressure, that anxiety, that stress in trying to inject human emotion and human effort into the whole situation. How, con how in contrast that is to El Shaddai, the great breasted God, who says, come and nurse from me. Fast, pray, fast, pray. We're not too late yet. Something's about to break forth. Can you nurse from me? He says, why did they do that? They want a great awakening. Oh, watch what you're wanting. They're crying, believing there will be an awakening. And they're good people. What have they done? They have not recognized the awakening of the bride. 1962 to 1964, something happened, and these folks didn't recognize it. See, by being a Christian, they feel the pull of the hour, but they haven't recognized what's been done, past tense. And that's what's making them feel that way. They know that something is supposed to happen, but they're looking for it way off in the future to come when it's already happened right by you. See, friends, we're in the time of the coming of the Lord. Now, according to just nature, and believing that God works according to nature, and knowing that our type is the type of a wheat, we have to realize that the rain isn't what's going to get us there. Matter of fact, the, the Bible even says this. It says that as snow in summer and as rain in harvest, so honor is not seemly for a fool. It would be just as, as, as seemly for a fool to have honor as it would be for God to use some special dispensation of grace in pouring forth His Spirit to bring us to a final harvest. It's the rain that brings them to maturity. But in that final harvest, we're going to find out what it is that God uses to bring His crops in. Brother Branham says this in Modern Events Made Clear by Prophecy. He says about the the wheat, he says, the shuck held it, but now the shuck pulls away. And remember, 20 years has passed and no more denominations have come of it. It won't. We're at the end of denominations. The wheat has taken shape. It was 1965, December thereof. But what's the matter with the wheat now? How many believes your wheat? He says, what's the matter with you? What's the matter with the wheat now? Is that, is that your question some days? You get up all the morning and says, well, if I'm supposed to get in the harvest, I feel like, what's the matter with me? He says, it must lay in the presence of the sun to ripen before the combine comes along and picks it up. We're not looking for some ladder rain to fall. That's already fallen. But now we're looking for that combine to pick it up. And all we have to do is lay in the presence of Jesus Christ. Now we're going to get to what that latter rain was. I don't want you to think I'm just going to pass over that. But let me take my time in getting there today. He says, now the events that we're seeing in place, it's all absolutely showed in the Bible of every age. We think we're out of cater. 
but we're not. Everything is just exactly with God's Word. Amen. I love it when where he says in the Shalom message, I've got it here because I found it so encouraging. He says now, and sometimes we get so discouraged and confused, but he says if you can't look up, or if you can't look ahead, just look up. Don't even try to look ahead. See, when we start trying to look ahead, that's where we get all these offshoots trying to inject ourselves and make something happen. He says, don't even try to look up, uh, look ahead. Just look up. What is it the Apostle Paul said? Looking unto Jesus. Not the next day, not the next event, not the next outpouring, not the next, next, next. Not what, what do I need to do next. It's just, where is God's hand in my life? Let me take a hold of that hand. Let it lead me into the promised land. Let me be lockstep with God's spirit. Not trying to figure out where God's going to step next, but let me just know where my Lord is today and step right behind him. And let me be faithful to that relationship that I'm called to. If he's calling me to holiness today, let me shuck off everything of the world. If he's calling me to be a greater witness today, let me shuck off my complexes and talk to the person and down at the gas station. Amen. Let me just be led of God Amen. and not worry about where God's going. He said that he would lead me. Amen. He would guide me. Yes. He would send me into all truth. He said he wouldn't point the way. Oh, hallelujah. God don't point the way, friends. God said that he would lead you Amen. and guide you as a shepherd does a sheep. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm glad that he don't make me some some kind of bull or some kind of horse and send me off on my way. He calls me his sheep, his little lamb. He takes me by his tender staff and leads me all the way to the promised land. Amen. Don't look ahead. Just look up. Put your hand in his, he says. Let him lead you. Look up. Don't ahead. Amen. But then we come back to asking ourselves, well, what happened in between 1962 and 1965, there was some kind of there was some kind of rain that came forth. There was some kind of a revival. Brother Branham said that we were looking for it. 1965, the invisible union of the bride of Christ. He says, "Watch then, the spiritual bride, when she begins to have a revival. Watch the fruits of it. It's not empty out all the hospitals." It's not some public display to the people. It's not all these outward manifestations. When she begins to come back and line herself up with the word of God. Oh, hallelujah. So that's where the bride's revival is. The invisible union of the bride and the bridegroom. Lining herself up with what? Christ, the word. That's what we're being called to. If you want to know what do I need to do to get ready for a rapture, just ask yourself, what is the rapture? Why, it's just the call to the marriage supper, that's all. It's just a call to the wedding feast. So my question to tonight is, are you married? Are you ready for the wedding feast? Don't try to make yourself, well, I haven't, I haven't, raised the dead yet, or I haven't checked off this spiritual accomplishment. I haven't spoken in tongues yet. I haven't done this. I, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't. Ask yourself, what has he done in my life? How much have I allowed him to do in my life? Am I allowing him to bring me into one with him? one isn't just doing the works of Christ. one is knowing Christ and having his character, having his spirit. You know, he said that there would be many that would come to me in, in that day, and he would say, Lord, Lord, uh, many works have we done in your name. Yeah. And yet he would say, depart from me, for I never even knew you. I would rather be the person that never did any works, but knew him, yeah. and still believed in his Amen. works in my life, Amen. and told others of the same, than to be the one that was so hypocritical as to tell everyone about Jesus Christ, but never come into real fellowship with Him. Tell my children about Christ. Tell the people at work about Christ. But really, I never came to know Him. Let me not be that. Amen. That is what we're striving for. That's where the bride's revival is. When she begins to come back and line herself up with the Word of God. He says, watch then again. 
you'll see how that the scriptures at that time, there will be a message to come out and sweep and catch that bride, catch that woman elect. Oh, I believe that's the message that we're hearing today. A message that's prophesying again to God's bride. Though the, though the prophet has gone off the scene, yet there's a five-fold message and a five-fold ministry that's repeating that message. And that's what's catching the bride in this last hour. So where is the bride's revival? The bride's revival is in the Word. Brother Branham, in Restoration of the Bride Tree, he teaches us that those four critters that came there and ate away at the bride tree, the pommel worm and the locust and the canker worm and the caterpillar, he said that that's a type of the four restorations that had to come. He said the first restoration was justification. Under, underneath Luther, he says, the just shall live by faith. And Wesley comes along and brings a message to shape up the church and get her to you know, take off the worldliness, a, a message of sanctification. Then you see the Azusa Street Revival and, and, and the gifts. And Pentecost got hung up on all the gifts, and she did exactly the opposite of what the Apostle Paul told her to do. The Apostle Paul, speaking to the early church, he said, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts. Notice he didn't say it the other way around. He didn't say, follow after spiritual gifts and desire charity secondarily. He said, follow after charity, which is love, which is God. Follow after Him. Follow after that relationship with Christ. But now, that doesn't mean that we shuck off all the gifts that God restored to us. But I think it would be a pretty poor bride indeed that didn't appreciate a few roses from her husband every once in a while. Didn't appreciate some gifts on Mother's Day. Didn't appreciate some, some kind of gift giving. But that's not what we're in it for, is it? I, I, I know my wife didn't marry me because I gave her a, a pretty looking ring on her finger. She appreciated it. She desired it. I'll, I'll even say she desired it. She desired a pretty looking ring. But what was it? There was something behind that, that token symbolized. The gift is just a symbol of God's love. And there's where we want to follow after. So what's the fourth thing that could be restored? It was the Word itself. Underneath the Malachi 4 or 5 ministry. Notice I didn't say the Holy Ghost was restored. Because the Holy Ghost was there all along. We didn't just start receiving the Holy Ghost at the end of this age. The baptism of the Holy Ghost was to all believers. Acts 2.38, that this promise is unto you and unto your children, and as many as would believe, even as those that are afar off. So all through the ages we had the Holy Ghost. But what was the difference now? Brother Branham said the difference now was that that church had been bound, had bound the Holy Ghost for nearly 2,000 years underneath martyrdom back there, under the church ages, and they bound the Holy Ghost at the door of creeds and dogmas so that the Holy Ghost could not work but she, that church, is going to be liberated. She's coming back, and that's what the Bible said. The Holy Spirit has been bound in these denominational rivers for almost 2,000 years, but is to be loosed again in the evening time by the evening time message. He didn't say it, but I'll say by the evening time messenger, because it's the word that comes to the prophets. And the Holy Spirit back in the church again, Christ himself, Revealed in human flesh in the evening time. Bound by what? Bound by creeds and dogmas like the days of miracles are past. That took away people's faith in God's word. Well, he was, he received stripes for your healing. But I don't know how, I don't know how they preach it. But you know, the, the days of miracles are past so that God only does your healing in smaller ways. He doesn't do miraculous healings. So we're going we're gonna to start compartmentalizing God's power and the way that God's going to manifest Himself to you. And so they'll teach that the book of Acts was just a, a template to show God's power but, and to, to get the message to spread through the world, but then he kind of dialed it back a little bit. But what does that do to people's faith? Faith in a God that, not that they walk away and don't believe God anymore, but they don't believe that God can affect them in the way that God wants to be able to manifest Himself to them. What about, what about the 
the doctrine of serpent seed. Why does that matter? How does that, how does that bind the Holy Ghost by man's creeds and dogmas? Can we just be real here? I, 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 why does it matter? Why does it matter? What, what, what impact does it have to you that you've been taught the doctrine of the serpent seed and what really happened in the garden? Well, for one thing, I don't believe in a fairy tale. When I go back in the Bible and I start reading about her grabbing an apple or a pear or something off the tree, and uh, all of a sudden she recognizes that she's naked, and she grabs a hold of that apple and gives it to her husband, and he recognizes that he's naked, it doesn't make any sense to me. Matter of fact, the only reason why it makes sense to people, I think, is because they've been raised up in it since they were children, when fairy tales made sense. But when you start realizing that it was a sex act in the garden, that it's the, that the, that the, the same thing that made you and I realize that we were naked is the same thing that made Adam and Eve realize that they were naked, that they, that they lost their innocence at that time, then the Bible makes sense now. It's no longer a story. And now the continuity of Scripture can be kept. And now it's something that I can have faith in. And I can see that, that the Scripture is solid from Genesis to Revelations. And that it makes sense to me. And then if that makes sense to me, then everything has to make sense to me. And I can start knocking on, I can start knocking on the Scripture. And it's like, it's like when you're knocking on a wall. You look for the hollow spots. And when you, when you come across something solid, you know that that's something you can... You can drive a hammer and a nail into. Amen. And before, maybe you, you came across the scripture and said, well, I don't, I don't really understand that, but that's what everybody teaches, so we'll just kind of go with it that it was an apple. Yeah, right. Or maybe this denomination says it's a pear. It feels kind of hollow. I, I'll just move on to the stuff that I really know about, like Calvary and yeah. Amen. these fundamentals. But it's all Christ. Right. It's all the Word of God. So if there's something in this word that doesn't make sense to you now, you can keep on knocking on it until you find a hollow place and say, God, and there's still many scriptures for me that I come across and say, God, I don't understand this, but I'm not going to set it aside. I might set up, set up on a shelf for a while, but I want you to bring together the continuity of scripture. And if, I, if it's not continuous for me, then I know I'm not looking at it right. And bring, it in, get, bring Genesis into line with Revelation until every book in the Bible lines up for me. And now we can have faith in it. What about baptism in the name of Jesus Christ? There's another thing that was bound by man's creeds and dogmas. Baptism in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, the Holy Ghost. But what was it? It was a baptism without a promise. Because we weren't baptized according to Acts 2.38 that says, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and then you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. But now I can have faith and say, now that I understand what I'm doing, and I understand that Jesus Christ is how God revealed himself to this world, that he is the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, that it's one God just changing his mask out, as it were. And I know who I serve, and I'm not a polytheist. I believe in one God, and not in three separate persons, but in different manifestations to man. That Jesus, that Jesus Christ is Jehovah of the Old Testament, and Jehovah of the Old Testament is Jesus of the New. And when I'm looking at the Old Testament, and I'm looking at the Jesus in the New Testament, I'm looking at the same person. I'm looking at the same God, the same characteristics, this, just a slightly different manifestation. And now I can get down in those waters and say, I'm going to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ today. And when I raise up from these waters, I'm identifying myself with Jesus Christ. I know who I'm identifying myself with. I'm not questioning whether I'm identifying part of myself with the Holy Ghost and part of myself with God the Father and part of myself with the Son. Like somebody said, I, I didn't, as a, as a Trinitarian said, I didn't know who I was praying to, so I split my prayers up between the three of them so they wouldn't get jealous of one another. What kind of confusion is that? That's what Satan wants to do is because when we start having confusion enter in, it breaks down faith. 
introduces doubt. And now you can't stand solid as a Christian. But the Christian that has a revelation of the name of Jesus Christ can get down in the waters and say, when I get up from these waters today, I will hold within my hand the token of God's promise for the Holy Ghost. And if God don't give me the, prom the promise of the Holy Ghost and manifest it to me as soon as I break forth from those waters, I'm going to hold Acts 2.38 in my hand until he blesses me with an outpouring and a sealing of the Holy Ghost, the earnest of my inheritance until the day of my redemption. Yes, sir. Amen. And I can walk solid in that. And I can say, I, I didn't get it yesterday, but I'm holding on to the promise. Just like Abraham, I didn't get my son yesterday, but I'm holding on to the promise. Just like Noah, I didn't get a flood yesterday, but I'm holding on to the promise. I'm building this ark. And one day, after I, one day I'm going to be sealed with pits from within and I without. And when the judgment falls and the rains come, that Holy Ghost will hold me. Oh, hallelujah. I tell you what. As a Christian, if I got baptized in, in the name of Jesus Christ, I broke forth from those waters, I wouldn't fear one bit if a car came and hit me afterwards because I'm still holding on to the promise of God and His Scripture. Maybe I didn't feel the Holy Ghost. Maybe I didn't interpret it correctly that I had gotten it or not. But I'm still, I would still walk up to those pearly gates and say, Lord, I, maybe I just didn't know what I was talking about, didn't know what I was feeling. I don't know if I'm holding the Holy Ghost right now, but I know one thing I'm holding. I'm still holding on to your promise. I did everything I knew how to do. I was true to the revelation you gave me, and I'm holding on to Acts 2.38. Oh, I believe those pearly gates would swing open for me. That's the difference now. That now that Holy Ghost was resident within the, the, the body of Christ all those years, but bound by creeds and dogmas. Now we can take a hold of it and have faith and confidence towards it. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. So where are we at now then? I don't believe we're fullest virgin here tonight. Remember the fullest virgin when they recognized that it was the hour to have oil in their lamps. They went out and they went to those who sold the oil in the markets. But there was a group that already had the oil. And I believe there's a group sitting here tonight that already had the oil. And you didn't buy it with your money. You didn't buy it with your efforts. But you bought it by simply nursing from El Shaddai, believing on his promises. And it was given to you. So what do we do in this hour then? I believe we do according to Isaiah 60, verse 1, where the prophet tells us, Arise and shine, for thy light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise and shine upon thee. Rise up and do what? Trim our lamps. If your lamp has started to smoke over, don't think that, it's, that you need some new revival some new denomination, some new movement within the message, some new camp meeting. I believe that you can get everything that God has for you right here in this church. Amen. It's the word that you need, friends. And if your lamp is smoking up, it's time to just simply trim it. Maybe trim some worldliness out of your life. Maybe trim some time out of your day so you can commit yourself to growing your roots as a as a wheat waiting for harvest and saying i know that rain has already fallen let me just grow my roots until i can grab a hold of it and reach down in this soil that god has planted me in and suck up this message suck up this word suck up this this beautiful outpouring of god's revelation that he's given us Amen. it's not to a group it's not some special dispensation of grace that we're still waiting for Though I don't preclude that God would still work in that way. I just say that, the, that our prophet said this. He said, I don't see anything that's left for the church now but the coming of the Lord. Just keep your lamps trimmed and shine for him. So that's all I can tell to you is just to keep your lamps trimmed. So it's not a group, but it's as we see in the Laodicean church age, it's to whomsoever will open unto me. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. To whomsoever will open the door unto me, I'll come in and I'll sup with him. Are you opening the door to Christ? Oh, that's different now, isn't it? 
that's a little bit less comfortable because now we got to look inward. And instead of looking outward, pray fast, pray, pray. Something's about to break forth. Something is coming. Some great whoosh of the Spirit is coming. Some torrential downpour that will just carry us all away and we'll be helpless against it. That's, that's what the flesh wants. Something that just washes all of our troubles away. But he says in Laodicea, I'm knocking at your heart's door. Are you going to open to me? Are you going to open to me on Thursday morning? Are you going to come and sup with me? Are we going to dine together? Brother Branham said it this way in trying to do God, sir, uh, God a service without it being his will. He said, I believe it was some nobleman then that went over to Wales to understand and figure out what all the mechanics was in the revival during the Welsh revival. Doesn't that just sound like us humans? Figure out what all the mechanics are. Write it down on a notepad, take it back home, package it, and, and produce it on the shores of America. And when they got off the ships with their tall hats and round collars, a little policeman they found swinging his club around like that, and they said, my good man, can you tell me where the Welsh revival is? How many remember where this little Welshman said the revival was? He said, it's in me. You're staring at it. You're facing it right now. The Welsh revival is in me. Well, I got something, some news for you tonight. There's something bigger than the Welsh revival tonight. There's a global revival. There's a bride age that's broken forth. There's a, a rising and a shining of Jesus Christ upon his people. There's a bride's revival that's upon us. The question is, can you identify yourself with it and say, you're looking at it. You're looking at the bride's revival. My, I and my Lord are in communion. It's an invisible union. You cannot see it, but it's happening every moment of every day. And I'm identified with it. Oh, hallelujah. Let's stand tonight. Praise the Lord. And as you're standing, I want to read just one verse. James, the practical apostle, he says in chapter 5, Be patient, therefore, brethren. Oh, I believe that stands true to the church tonight as we wait for God's coming. Be patient unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth. He waits for those tender grapes, as it were, and he hath long patience for it until he received the early and the latter rain. Be ye also patient. I see that he says that a couple of times. It must be important. Amen. Be patient. And what does he tell us to do? He says, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. So I hope I can just leave you with that tonight, friends. If, if you're wanting a restoration with God, if you're wanting a revival, be revitalized in Christ. Establish your hearts in what God has already given to us. He's given us great and precious promises. He gave us Elijah. He gave us Malachi 4, 5, and 6. He revealed his word to, to our hearts. Establish yourself in it. Make sure you're established in the present truth. And I believe that there you'll find that, that maturity that you're looking for. Don't look for another rain, but make sure that you're in the presence of the sun, ripening before the combine comes and picks us up. Mark, if you would come and we'll go ahead and close the service in a word of prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we just come before you, Father. Lord, we're so appreciative of the word that you've given to our hearts, Lord. A word of the Lord that we can have confidence in, Lord. I remember the prophet that he said, the, the, the greatest vindication of my ministry. And I was on the edge of my seat when I read those words. Maybe it was the resurrection of the dead, the cloud in the sky, the, the pillar of fire above his head. He said the greatest Vindication of my ministry is the fruit that it brings forth in the hearts and the lives of the believers. Lord, I believe that that ministry was the ministry of Jesus Christ through your servant. And I want it to go and accomplish everything it set out to do, Lord, in my life. I believe that would be the prayer of each person here, Lord. Maybe just with a lifted hand now, we would each symbolize as a token to you, Lord that that is our desire, that there would be a, a fruit that would be brought forth, Lord, a, a harvest, a crop, a mature wheat, Lord. 
grant it, Lord. May we each do our part each day to expose ourselves to that sunlight, that Christ light, that word that you've given, that we can become mature sons.